So, hi everybody, I'm Ralph Preston. We're here doing our Tuesday Stroke Buddies Stroke Survivor Support Group meeting. And today I'm going to do a little presentation on therapies all around you. If you got anything to say, feel free to just, you know, interrupt me or interject, whatever. Um, we'll also have a little time at the end where you can talk about some of the things that you do around the house. I think Abraham mentioned he washed the dishes this morning. There are lots of things. Maybe somebody will come up with some ideas that uh, I didn't ha I didn't have or come up with. So, so therapies all around you. Um, at some point, we'll talk a little bit about CIMT constraint induced mo movement uh, therapy. Um. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I did, which was a, a version of that. I called it the left hand Olympics because my left hand was the, my affected hand. And I felt like I was like training for the Olympics or something with it. I don't know where it came from. It doesn't make any sense to me now, but that's what I called it. And uh, so anyway, therapy is all around you. I'm going to start off with a couple of basic things. Um, it's not a simple thing to recover from a stroke, but I'm preaching to the choir here. All you know that. And since all strokes are different, all recoveries are also. And I found attitude to be the key because if you don't have a decent attitude, you're not going to do much in terms of uh, recovery or uh, therapy. So, uh, so how do you get moving? Uh, you start moving. And some of the things that you need to do is learn all you can about physical therapy. And this needs to be an ongoing effort. And I tell people to try and learn all they can about physical therapy and establish a good relationship with their physical therapists like the second or third time they go. The first time you go, they do an evaluation. You don't get much time. They're asking you to push up against this or that or follow their finger or whatever. And you don't get much uh, input time. But once they start working with you, you, you should be interacting with them and you should be saving all those sheets they gave you and um, asking them for homework and doing the homework. And another thing that's important is, some uh, often important, is to find out what type of stroke you had because different types of strokes have different effects on your body and therefore on your recovery. For example, most of the strokes that happen in the back of the head, cerebellum, brainstem, uh, pons, uh, thalamus. So some of them can uh, cause balance issues and uh, people who are basically hemiplegic from having a stroke in the uh, more frontal area of the brain, uh, typically don't, well, we all have balance issues, but they don't have that crazy dizziness balance stuff that other stroke survivors do. So that was too long, but it's important to find out because whatever kind of stroke you had might cause you to have issues that other people don't have, and you might want to address them. If you were me, you would definitely want to address them. Okay, so... I sort of said that, learn all you can, save the sheets, uh, search YouTube and other sources. Uh, oh, like the internet comma books, there's a typo. I knew I'd find one. Um, I always, well, I, I doubt anything and everything that I hear like hearsay from somebody who's not a doctor or a physical therapist. So when I hear, hear something like somebody like a stroke survivor, for example, I put some credibility in stroke survivors because they're living it. But um, I like to validate things with a therapist or an expert. That way I know that they're they're good. You've uh, all probably seen me ask Dr. Hetzler a question to validate something or other um, with him. And it's an opportunity for him to tell one of his dad jokes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there are a number of ways you can get moving on your own with someone's help, personal trainer, gym physiologist, physical therapy, therapy pool. Today, we're mostly going to talk about the things you can do at home 
uh, and most of the, in terms of therapy is all around you. It's also called functional therapy. It is a proven technique like um, constraint induced motion therapy is. And uh, it's basically a lighter version of that. Uh, I'd heard about the oven mitt, but I had no idea what CIMT was when I uh, first had my stroke. And well, I'll get into that. I kind of developed a slightly softer approach. Uh, so there are a number of ways to get moving. Today, we're going to talk about what you can do at home. I thought I'd show you some specialty equipment, just, um, well, a couple of reasons. Uh, we, you'll see when we get to a couple of later slides that show specialty equipment. Uh, so there's our friend Polly Hutchinson hooked up to a bike that um, has eStam built in. Uh, you can see the tech, the uh, therapist hooking up the um, um, pads and everything. And that bike is uh, really is special because when you go around, when your feet go around, it knows where they are, whether you're pushing or pulling, and, and it gives little e-stem um, signals. Uh, I think you can only pedal about 40 RPMs, though, before it doesn't work anymore. And, of course, you can go to places that have all kinds of fabulous things, like check out that walking track, especially like the line that is directly under it. So you can, like, well, he's actually... The guy's actually doing a difficult uh, walk, which is walking the line, putting one foot in front of the other. You got balance issues. You won't be doing that right away. I can tell you that. Say, so, uh, maybe after years of work. Is what? I said maybe after years of work. Yeah, I. And that's a maybe. You know, I mean, I still have trouble with that. I could and walk on that line. As long as I'm putting my foot, um, uh, you know, a foot or so ahead of the other one. The one I have trouble with, and that's the one that you, I always when practice, is putting that heel to toe, heel to toe. Because you don't have the spread this way, and you don't have the spread this way at all, because you're walking the line. When you got the spread this way, you've got like a little more, it takes, I guess, forward, backwards out of the equation. You only have left, right. When you put your feet, your heel up against your toe, you got left, right, and forwards and backwards. Anyway, just going to show you some things. Basically, I was showing you this stuff because it's great if you have access to it, but it's not what makes you better. And you don't, uh, you know, so you got all kinds of crazy, you know, $4,000 walking frame there on the left and a $20,000 or $40,000 robotic treadmill complete with ex exoskeletons, it looks like. Um, and you know, the pool pool's always a good place. This is me and my friend Kathy working with Rob, who was had a terrible stroke and then was allergic to TPA and it had a, a worse second stroke due to the allergy. But anyway, pool's great. Uh, now we're getting to what I call real specialty equipment. There's your basic Costco um, shopping cart. Everybody knows I think shopping carts are the best walkers out there. On the right, we got a guy, you can see his Hemi walker. We got a guy who um, hired somebody for a hundred bucks or 200 bucks to weld that together and bolt it to his porch. So he's got a little walking frame and he can go on the inside or Notice how it's away from the wall. He can walk around the thing on both sides because uh, it's not up against the wall. Anyway, and, you know, here's me taking a basic walking frame on the left and adding a couple sandbags to it to turn it into parallel bars so you can't tip it over very easily. Same thing with a rollator. These are all mine. And on the right, there's a standing frame I, uh, I built for um, Stephen, who had a terrible stroke. And uh, he couldn't be transported uh, very easily, so they had home therapy come. And when we went through a couple stages, I brought that thing over before the therapist ever showed up. He ignored it for about two weeks, and then he asked me about it, checked it out, said, hmm, seems pretty stable. And I got a picture of him using it with the therapist using it with Steven. But I really like this picture because this is why I built it. That's his dad and his wife and no therapist. 
So his dad and his wife are able to um, work with him to, you know, help him work on standing, which means he can do it more than the 45 minutes twice a week that the therapist comes. And that's key because I don't believe anybody gets better in two 45 minute sessions. Uh, you've all heard me say the therapist is like a piano teacher. You have to go home and practice. So those are some things that um, specialty equipment that I made up with, you know, well, the rollator is a $60 rollator and the walking frame is a basic $30 walking frame. I did custom build the um, uh, parallel bars out of Home Depot um, plumbing parts, actually. And, you know, so these are here for a reason because that's my friend, friend Nagda on the left and we got him a couple of uh, stroke buddies, uh, raised some money uh for jeffrey in the center and for nagda we got nagda a couple of uh afos he needs two and he spends an hour or so at that walking frame that he had his care he and his caregiver built that they just uh you know it's like leftover metal from something and they buried it in the ground and jeffrey's walking with a old a plastic uh lawn chair uh anyway People make do with what they have. They don't have access to those fancy. These guys don't, they're all in Africa. They don't have access to that fancy rehab facility with the overhead track. So you do what you can. And that's the reason I put these in, in this little presentation, because that's what we're going to talk about. You, you work with what you got around you. You do what you can and you make use of the things that are around you. Okay. So this is my philosophy. What's the most important devices? A therapist attitude well i'll tell you what i found and this is opinion but and you can welcome to have your own but i found that attitude is the most important because you can't sit in the corner well you can sit in the corner but with a crappy attitude you're going to sit in the corner and not get much done so you won't get uh, better very quickly uh the therapists, I think, is, uh, like I said, the piano teacher. They're they're kind of key because they're kind of our source for information. And while I don't knock devices, not everybody has access to devices. Not everybody can, this insurance is going to pay for an $80,000 robotic arm. And not everybody's got $500 a month to rent that same robotic arm. So, uh, you know. Well, uh, devices are great if you have them, but you can get, I didn't use any of them. Uh, I didn't really have access to much, especially not in the early days. In fact, I thought I got cheated out of the parallel bars. I, thought, I saw everybody over in the parallel bars. I finally asked about it and they said, well, you should consider yourself lucky. We only take the really bad cases over to the parallel bars. So you don't need them. Here, I thought I was getting cheated in, and I didn't really need them. Anyway, so, uh, you know, time to get moving. And, you know, back to attitude. A lot of people, you know, have this, uh, I don't know, I don't, you know, I'm not motivated. I can't do that. I can't do this. I come up with an excuse for everything. You all seen them in the groups. You know, you make a suggestion, I make a suggestion, or you make a suggestion, Bob Anderson, or anybody makes a suggestion they got a reason why they can't so you got to move that i can't to well maybe i can and from there to i'll try once you get to i'll try you're really you're, you're going somewhere now because if it's so if you don't lose faith and you keep trying you'll eventually succeed at something and then you're at i can and um so I've, it's funny because I think I mentioned this graphic about 50 times in different meetings, and here it is for the first time. Uh, this is just a basic stock market. I, I mean, it's the Dow Jones Industrial Average from, well, 2019. I've made it up a few years ago. And, you know, there's basically the concept here is, you know, you're going to have good days and not so good days. So, uh, you know, you got to look at uh, your overall progress. See, look at that red line. Now, you know, when at, at you know Friday, May 31st, that low point, that afternoon, you might not be feeling so good about yourself. So maybe it'd be time to pull out in your brain, either pull out the sheet or you wrote down about all the things that you've been able to do 
do lately or remember them um, and remember that, you know, you really are on track. You know, we all go th uh, through those days. You know, there's another one back in April where you're going along good and then you go down and then you get back on track. So you have to be able to deal with those, you know, dips in your in your curve. Because um, I, I, you know, I, I found I didn't wake up and uh, the same with the same uh, level of ability or whatever every day. Uh so that's why it's important to pay attention to all improvements. Uh, write them in a log if you can't remember them. Set small achievable goals because success builds on success. You don't want to tr set up a goal that's you're not going to achieve maybe ever or or anytime soon because that'll frustrate you. You're back to forty five minutes. Nope, forty five minutes once a once or twice a week. Um, you, you might get better, but it's mostly going to be spontaneous brain healing and, and time. So it'll take a long time. Recovery is based on repeats. We've all heard that, you know, thousands and thousands of repeats. So 45 minutes uh, at therapy, you're often learning stuff at therapy. You're not doing the repeats. The repeats happen at home on your own. So, and back to, well, establishing a good relationship and becoming your own PT. And um, that's a little bit more about therapy. I, I just I left it in from another presentation. Uh, had We've had two or three therapists, two, I believe. I can name them, but I won't. Who said, um, a plateau is when your therapist doesn't know what to do anymore. And I kind of agree with that. So... How do you deal with that? You could share what you've learned about challenging the brain and mixing things up and ask them to help you mix things up because you feel like you're at a plateau. Hell, you might even educate them a little bit, which wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, I try and educate uh, therapists about our side of things because I, I think it helps them. And I'm hoping it helps the next person because if I educate a therapist about something, then when they run into that again, they go, oh, yeah, that's right. Ralph said something about this, and and maybe they can use it and apply it. <clears throat> apply it. So, so, again, the brain needs to be challenged. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Mass practice is the idea of doing things in as big a block as you can. Early on, nobody can do four hours of physical therapy in a row. Um, maybe never. But the more you concentrate your um your efforts <clears throat> into bigger blocks it's been um proven to work dr hetzler got me with his uh, he asked me a question in his first presentation on neuroplasticity he said so ralph if somebody got up and did an hour of therapy from nine to ten and one from eleven to twelve and then after lunch did one from one to two and then from three to four would that be better than if they did it from 8 to 12 in the morning? Or would it be better to do it 8 to 12 in the morning? And I said, ah, I think it'd be better to spread them out and do it four times. And he said, nope. Wow. I'm proven to, that you can put them all together. But again, who can do four hours of physical therapy? I didn't even. Well, I did 10 to 12 hours a day, but I did it 45, 50 minutes at a time. Took a little brain break. I, I had to do I had to do that. I um it was basically you know, therapy was all day every day for like two months. I lived in the I lived at the rehab hospital. So that was what I did with my day, you know. Well, I lived at the rehab hospital for about a month, about a little over three weeks. And um everybody wanted to go home. I wanted to stay. The only reason I'd well, I had two reasons I'd Oh, I couldn't stay because my insurance company basically kicked me out. I was, I did pretty well. So I reached the um, transfer. You have to be able to transfer toilet yourself and eat basically is what they like to see you do before you go home. So I met the metric and insurance is going to kick me out, but I would have loved to stay another three weeks or another six weeks because I had a lot of therapy and I was getting better. 
Mm-hmm. So I thought about that and I said, well, I'll just do it at home. So, I mean, I, I, my house was a rehab hospital for about a year. It's the way I, yeah, I, I, yeah, that was, I definitely continued when I got home. I don't, I don't know what exactly the reason was. I mean, I was only 17. I was still a kid. I wasn't really in charge of what was going on. So well, you were scared, I, don't, I don't know what the reason was. I got sent home, but I had, I had school to get back to. So. And life. And you're probably scared like me. You know, we're also in those early days. We're all scared. We're not going to get better ever. Cause you don't well, really know. I don't, I wasn't, progress. I wasn't really scared. I wasn't going to get better. I, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't, I guess I don't really remember considering that. I remember considering I'm healthy. I know what I got to do. I know what the physical therapists have told me. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a healthy kid. I'm, I was going to continue doing stuff because that's what you do. It's, I mean, I wasn't about to look forward to another 40 years or 50 years of life whilst sitting in a wheelchair i was planning on getting up and doing stuff and making a life for me and i kind of did i guess yeah me too but but i was scared maybe they scared me when i had a couple doctors say well you might not get out of that wheelchair i don't know why they do that maybe they do that to scare you yeah, that, I, that might think. be exactly it. I don't know. I remember <laughs> like when I first woke up from a coma, my mom, my mother used to tell me like, you know, where I was and what time of day it was and what was going on. So like if I woke up, I wouldn't freak out or something. Um, but I remember her telling me that the, the doctors, the doctors didn't, weren't really sure what they were saying then. So I was kind of like, hey, well, let me get back on my feet and we'll show these people what we're saving. Right. Yeah, that was my attitude too. <laughs> so um yeah. and uh, I was I was kind of scared. Uh, I wasn't scared after I started making improvements because I, I could see a direct correlation between the effort I was putting in and getting better. And once you get to that point, then that's really motivating because you say, okay. Well, maybe the more I put in, the you know, the faster and be- and and more better. Not no, Ralph, more better is not a word. And the better you'll you you could get. So I went at it pretty hard. Oh, so attitude is that you know back to attitudes everything. And I gave a motivational speech one time. We were talking about attitude. I talked about attitude, and of course. A big chunk of it was about attitude. It was early on in my recovery. And when I was done, uh, I had a bunch of people come up and ask me questions. One of them was a neurologist who came up and we talked about a little bit about attitude. And he told me that there have been studies done and that the more you move, the less uh, you're likely to be depressed. So that's another good reason to get going. So That's another huge thing right there. So I'm not an expert in constraint-induced motion therapy, but I thought I would mention a little bit about it um, because I had heard of it, but I didn't know. I'd heard about putting an oven mitt on your hand, but I I never did until actually, well, I do all the time when I got to get something out of the oven, but I I really didn't in terms of therapy until last night when I put one on to take this um, picture. Um. I wrote to Dr. Edward Taub, who um, uh, kind of discovered, uh, I wouldn't say invented, maybe you could say invented it, constraint-induced motion therapy at the University of Alabama. And I haven't heard back. And uh, uh, recently, um, William Lowe told me that he's in his 90s. And I looked it up, and he's 92. So... Maybe that's why. Maybe I don't, may not be uh, teaching or practicing anymore. But William said that he was a big believer. Marilyn, you uh, you commented on the uh, alternative therapies talk we had uh, on Sunday night, you know, where we talked about this as one of the things. And actually, William went through a program in um, Australia 
and he was going to come to the to the University of Alabama and go through their program. And he gave me the name of a doctor who he actually met in person, who was like the second to Dr. Taub in all the studies that they did. And he looks to be in, in his 50s or so. So I'm going to write to him. Maybe we can get somebody who really knows the science behind it. It's basically a pretty simple concept. Um, and it's been proven to work. Um, sometimes some I've heard about therapy centers. Actually, I, a couple of survivors I know went to programs, not at the University of Alabama, but other programs. And one or two of them said they actually tied their hand behind their back or, I mean, or immobilized it behind their back. That's even more than the oven mitt, because at least if you if you have an oven mitt on, you got something you can push against. You may even be able to move that thumb a little bit, which is something you can't do with your early on with your affected hand. But so basically the oven mitt will uh, anybody who doesn't believe it, go put on an oven mitt this afternoon after after lunch, after this presentation, and you'll find out you can't do much with an oven mitt on except take hot things out of the oven. Um, so it's a good way to um, uh, restrict movement. And the main reason uh, I would want to do that would be if I couldn't control my brain. Uh, for example, I have a friend, Brooke, who does puzzles. And she was trying, I suggested trying to move the pieces with her affected hand, flipping them over and moving, picking them up and putting them where she thought they'd go, even trying to snap them in. And I said, if you can't snap them in, you can always switch to your other hand. Well, she tried that and she found her brain, she called it cheating. She found that her right hand would just go do it automatically. The brain takes the laziest, easiest way out. So uh, that didn't surprise me. And she told me she was sitting on her hand, so it wouldn't happen, but her hand kept going to sleep. So I suggested an oven mitt. And she went and did it and said, oh, that works great. But then what happened was she, after several hours with the oven mitt, it was frustrating. I said, take the oven mitt off. You don't want to ruin your love for puzzles, you know, trying to do uh, therapy, you know. Always everything with ther with recovery is common sense, you know. That was just a basic common sense answer. So CIMT is valid. I'd heard about putting an oven mitt on your uh, unaffected hand when I was in the rehab hospital, but I didn't know anything much about it. it seemed kind of radical to me. Um, a lot of what we're talking about here is once you get a little teeny bit of movement in your hand, uh, your affected hand. If you don't have any movement at all, it's hard to force it to do things. Um, if you have small amount of movement and you do force it, you'll find that you get more and more movement out of it. You'll also find that it's incredibly frustrating to do things like try and pick up small objects with your with your affected hand in the early days. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of swear words came out of my mouth, I can tell you that. So I knew about this. I, I was just trying to get better. I didn't like, you know, sit down and like write a thesis on how I'm going, what my program is going to be to get better. I just kind of did it. I just kind of lived it. Once I got my hand working a, a little bit, I remembered the whole oven mitt thing, and I came up with um, a term. I call them the left hand Olympics. I don't know where that came from. It seemed like I was, well, I tried to do everything with my left hand, like opening jars so you can uh, learn that rotating movement again, because that involves your wrists as well as your fingers. See my wrists moving? In order to do that, you, your fingers go around, but your wrists also moves from well, if I do it up here, you see my wrist moving right there. Anyway, uh, I opened jars. I did stuff like, I, I, I went to a great deal of trouble. I would like pick up a glass. Well, I'd pick it up with my left hand. Then if I wanted to put it back in the refrigerator, I'd transfer it to my right hand, open the refrigerator door with my left hand, put it back in my left hand, put it in the refrigerator, now it's gone. And I could take my left hand and close the refrigerator. Now, normally, you know, before a stroke, we'd open it up with one hand, stick it in with the other, close it with the hand we opened it with and be done. But I made sure that I did everything possible with um, my left hand. 
So that's what we're going to talk about um, today. Just give you some examples and then we'll listen to some of the ways that you guys already do this because you're probably already doing some version of this. Maybe you can just step it up. So therapies all around you. These are early days. Uh, I tried to return to cooking. I like to cook and I like to eat my cooking. So I tried to return to cooking. I'm left hand affected. So I just had to hold things uh, as opposed to try and learn how to use a knife again with my um, affected hand. I keep the knife out of my affected hand and I've not had any accidents except twice I kind of stabbed myself well my left hand stabbed myself on the knife when it went crazy so I keep the knife away from my affected hand and I remember I don't have any zucchini there I got onions and carrots and red peppers looks like don't know what I'm making mm. and I remember cutting the zucchini and I couldn't like hold them that they would like roll and so I'd like you know move the knife with the rolling and then go okay it's safe Choom. Uh, I never did cut myself. One day I went to therapy and they uh, had me get those little uh, cones. Uh, they use them sometimes to make obstacle courses too. They usually live on the top shelf of the therapy uh, center cabinet and they'll have you get them down and they'll have you put them back up. If they really want to tax you, they'll have you stack them on top of each other on top up there while you put them back because that's tricky because you can knock the one that's already up there over anyway so i got home that night and i went to take the vitamins down and i went wow this is what's the difference between a, a therapy cone and a jar of vitamins so actually for about a month or maybe two or three months i took the vitamins down and if you can see there are about like six or seven kinds up there on the top shelf I took them all down and put them all back up a half a dozen times before I pulled the vitamins out. I just, you know, did like 10 minutes of vitamin therapy up and down, up and down. And here's like learning how to twist that lid. You want to twist the lid. You know, it's real easy to take your unaffected hand and twist the container. But what are you doing for the affected hand? Nothing. So you got to learn how to... Uh, twist uh so you can take things uh apart i've got one i don't know if i have a picture in it here yeah i think i do later i have a favorite one i'll, I'll save my comment because i think i remember seeing it this morning when i flipped through this stuff so that's early on that's about less than so that's probably about three or four months after my stroke no nah, it's more than that because i couldn't get my arm up that high for about six months Anyway, that's fairly recent, uh, fairly soon after my stroke. So that'd be 14 years ago. Uh, some of these are the lawn mowing is uh, uh, when I lived in the mountains, as you can see. I, I found things, all these things were really good for me. I found with the lawnmower, like steering and having something to hold on to with that affected hand was real good. On the left, I'm actually vacuuming with my left affected hand. In the beginning, I could only do about a fourth of the house. I got to where I could do the whole house that way. And then now I do about half and half. I still do it sometimes when I remember. And then uh, on the right, that's after we moved here. So that's probably more like 10 years ago. And you know, that's a pretty complex task. I'm standing on a ladder, uh, so I'm balancing, I'm leaning, which nobody likes to do uh, on a ladder. I got to hold that, so I'm holding the screw gun in my unaffected hand, but I'm having to hold, you can see my thumb holding the, uh, I got the two pieces. Sometimes I did that with like a, a level, when I pound stakes, I do it with a level, on those on the vertical thing and a sledgehammer that's a lot of things you got to hold the level watch the bubble hit the hit hit the thing with the sledgehammer keep your fingers away from it don't fall off the ladder that's my running out of brain picture because okay. i've run out of brain and this is when i was building the garden it just you know there's so many things it's uh return to life mm. uh this is, i'm gonna flip through these kind of quick because uh, these are the 
12 hand videos I have. The first one doesn't involve anything. It's mental imagery or mental practice, thinking about opening. And then the second one is opening, passive movement, opening. But you, again, you think about it whenever you open or do anything with your other hand, whenever you're engaged in passive movement, think about opening. Okay, I'm opening my hand. I used to close my eyes. It helped me with the pictures. Uh, and so here are thumb push-ups. Nothing involved. Here's opposition. Nothing involved. Just your fingers. Uh, putty. Everybody's got therapy putty. Uh, on the right is, um, I make those, uh, that's a potato salad container from the deli. And um, that's my, uh, the first level of, um, I've, so I cut a hole in it and it's about three eighths of an inch wide and about two inches long. You can easily drop anything through there. Well, if you get better, I made another lid where I made it just barely wider than a quarter and barely, uh, I mean, barely longer than a quarter and barely wider than any coin. And that made it a lot harder to get them in. So just basically, it's a handful of change in a potato salad um, container. And, you know, if you don't have the skills to cut the uh, slot in and get somebody else to do it. Uh, here we got nuts and bolts. Uh, I went and bought about a dollar fifties worth of nuts and bolts at uh, Home Depot. And on the right, we got the post office rubber band. Actually, I use post office rubber bands. They don't give them out anymore. They were tan. That's a like broccoli or that's a vegetable band because they're always that blue or purple color. Um, this is kind of outdated. It's the way I did it. Now they make those finger spreaders. You can get it like a set of four. Yeah. It's like five holes. And you put all your fingers in and you can work on extending them. And for, for less than 10 bucks, you can get a set of four in like the therapy <laughs> colors, you know, yellow, red, green. Oh. Yeah, okay. Marilyn's <laughs> got one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yellow, green. So yeah. they're a lot easier because, see, the, the rubber bands, if you don't, Notice how they're, I've got the rubber band right at the base of my fingernail, at the base of the cuticle, because your finger goes up there, and that'll keep the rubber bands from sliding up your fingers. This is real frustrating. Um, they didn't have those. They didn't have those little things. Yeah, there's another one. I mean, there, there you go. Well, that's pretty good. Is that your affected hand? Yes. That's, do, that's really good. Uh, that's what you want to work on. You want to yeah, work Yeah, I, I need tension. to work on it. Yeah. I need you're doing very well there. Yes. So I don't recommend the rubber bands. And I actually say so in the video. When I made the video four or five years ago, those things were just barely starting. And I took some pictures of them and put them on the end of the video. Anyway, the point of this is there's a chip clip. I used uh, clothes pins and then I discovered chip clips. Chip clips I like better because they're wider and they don't twist on you. Anybody who's used clothes pins you know, when you go to do them uh, one finger at a time, and I did them all the way down to the pinky, pushing on them with a pinky, that's tricky. And the pinky's so small and the thumb's so far over there, look at the angle the thumb's on versus the angle the thumb's on here, see? So they twist a lot easier, and a chip clip doesn't twist. You can buy a, like a six-pack of chip clips for $1.50 at the supermarket, you know? And what's that? We got a hammer. Yeah, the hammer out of the drawer. And a deck of cards. And I actually, here's one I bought. I actually bought a $15 pegboard. I actually bought it. I used one in occupational therapy, but I never owned one until I decided I should make a video about it. And I bought that, this particular pegboard because... Oh, I don't know, four or five years ago, I was into pegboards. They came up and I bought three different pegboards for four different people. And I sent them around the country and I had them test them. And everybody liked this one best. And so I did too, mainly because you could stack the pegs and the pegs will just drop in another peg. And early on, it's kind of hard to push the, actually, this has square holes, you can see. And you're pushing a round peg into a square hole. It's a little tricky. You don't have enough downward motion to do it. You can just drop them in the ones that are already there. So 
Or you, or you could just play a whole bunch of cribbage. Yeah, that's cribbage is good because the cribbage board is actually smaller. I remember yeah. my occupational therapist, I looked for it uh, for a while. She had a, a checker set that was about that big. It had little teeny pins. Oh, wow. oh my God, those things were frustrating. <laughs> and uh, I used to... Um, I used to take all the pins and make geometric patterns out of them. She wanted me to just move them around. So I made like, you know, I'd do like every other one. I'd make like tile floors and different patterns because that's just what my brain told me to do. And she didn't care because she just wanted me to pick up those little pegs and, <laughs> and not swear. So, uh, okay, more therapies all running. We all got to clean the kitchen. So, uh, there's another mistake. I forgot to shrink wax on, wax off after I put the logos on. Anyway, we all got to clean the kitchen. So see if you can't use that affected hand some. Wax on, wax off is really good for a lot of things. Uh, you have to be able to hold on to the towel. So you got a little bit of grip. You got like wrists and fl finger flexor action all, all working there. And uh, I'll tell you what. There's your ultimate wax on, wax off opportunity there. Okay. <laughs> you can see my little uh, um, Volvo station wagon doesn't have near as much metal as that pickup truck does. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Plus, you got to stand on a step stool to get the roof right. I'm six foot tall, but I can't reach all the way to the middle without standing up on something. So there's some balance involved in that, which you shouldn't do if you don't have good balance. But there's a lot of waxing on, waxing off there, uh, uh, cleaning the car, especially in the spring, the time when I did that, because it was absolutely covered in green, st sticky green pollen. You had to scrub off. Um, so back to the counters. This is just some basic weight bearing. I sometimes do this kind of stuff while my uh, there's my microwave over my left shoulder. So when I'm cooking my dinner, I'll sometimes I'll balance on one leg or I'll uh, do some weight bearing, especially in the early days. I do that uh, affected hand only weight bearing because that's real good. Um, you know, it takes a while to get all those fingers all the way open and that wrist bent 90 degrees. So you can't even hardly I can only bend it. That's my unaffected arm. I can do the same with my affected arm, I think. Got some shake. But that way you can get, when you put it down, you can get the full 90 degrees. So you're um, stretching those tendons a little bit, which is something that's important. When we don't move stuff, our tendons, our tendons tend to, wow, tend to shrink a little bit. So when you want to try to get voluntary movement with shrunken tendons, that's tricky. So that's one reason that stretching is important. Um, cause you don't want to get into having any, you don't want to get into learn non-use, which we won't talk about. Basically, if you don't use your hand or any body part, your brain will forget how to use it. Uh, so you don't want to get into that. And, uh, you, um, definitely want to stretch any and all things so that the tendons will move through the full range of motion and, makes it easier to get that voluntary movement back. You're not trying to pit muscles that don't work very well because they're not connected to the brain against tendons that have shrunk somewhat. So uh, and I, I always say work what works. This may be out of place, but I left it there. I had somebody who said in one of the groups, I've seen this a couple of times actually, well, they say my hand, I, I've got some motion in my hand, but my shoulder's not working. So I'm, I'm, I'll wait till I get my shoulder because the therapist said starts in the shoulder, goes to the elbow, the wrist, and the and the uh, hand. That is the normal progression. But remember, we're all different. We all had different strokes. We all have different recoveries. Okay, me, for example, I got my hand back first, then my wrist, then my sh straighten my arm. It took me forever to get my hand to go over my, my arm to go straight up over my head. Um, I got stuck about here. Well, once you, once you move past here, you can put your hand on your uh, scapula 
once you go up above your shoulder level, that scapula starts rotating and you're using other muscles <laughs> other than just the lifting ones. So, I mean, I told this kid, kid, he was probably 25, I'm 73, so everybody under 30 is a kid to me, I suppose. I told this young man, no, no, work what works. If you have, he was getting what uh, William Lowe calls flickers of movement. He was getting little uh, bits of movement in his hand and he was about to ignore them because his therapist said, comes back the other way. Well, first thing you should, could do would be go talk to your therapist and say, hey, my hand's moving, what do I do? If they don't say, uh, work what works, then, uh, I'd be questioning what they, what they know because... If you get flow, small movements or what William calls flickers of movement, you can build on them. So uh, don't ignore something that's working. Uh, okay, here we are back to the vitamins. Um, in uh, my new house, and another thing I do was be, I, I take the lids off or flip the lids up with my affected hand. And I put them in my unaffected hand, pour them out into my affected hand. And I mean, you could pour them out with your affected hand under the counter or your other hand and put them in your unaffected hand. And I put them in my mouth. That's not an easy motion. Uh, first of all, your wrist has to turn in order to go from here to like that. You can see my wrist moving in addition to my hand. You're rotating your hand. You're moving your wrist. You have to hold on to the darn thing. And you have to find your mouth. For me, in the early days, it was hard for me to find my mouth. I just kind of put it in there and go <laughs> with an open hand and move it around if it didn't go in my mouth. Uh, I've gotten better at it. Uh, so back to the, you know, this is more of the left-hand Olympics. Uh, oh, yeah, there's my favorite uh, twist top. That's... um. Costco Kirkland balsamic vinegar bottle. I go through a couple of them a year because I like balsamic vinegar. And he has a spring pour top on it. So there's like, when you take the lid off, a pour top pops up. When you go to put the lid back on, you have to push the pour, the pour top down and, and push it down while you push it down evenly so the threads will catch. Not so easy. Actually, actually have an empty one in my therapy kit. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm that guy, I guess. Uh, washing dishes. Now, there I am washing dishes with the stoneware. And that was because I took that picture two, three years ago when we shot um, a video called A Trip to the Kitchen that I still need to edit. Uh, and the onions on the right are also from that video. But... Uh, uh, in the early days, we had a picnic set for the camper. We had a camper on our property and had a set of picnic dishes, uh, plastic um, plastic uh, dishes. And in fact, I got one right here underneath this plant. Yeah, so there's a, basically a plastic dish can't break it so i got them out we had a set of four a set of six and i just practiced uh, washing dishes with them for a while until i felt comfortable enough to pick up the stoneware the stoneware was a wedding present i guess that doesn't matter much now but at the time it, i guess it did well i still use the stuff so i wouldn't want to break it but um and then cutting I hold things with my affected hand and cut them with my unaffected hand. So more onions and broccoli, picking things up and holding them while you're cutting them up, up in the ante. Uh, I return to picture framing. Uh, picture framing, well, I did a lot of picture framing for um, to sell prints. I also did, every year I did a few for the land trust would that I worked with would give away one of my prints with a brass plaque on it to the volunteer of the year and the conservationists of the year and that kind of thing. So um, those are all things that I um, um, framed post-stroke. 
on the left, I still got that one. I made that for my wife uh, for Christmas uh, two months after she left, and she wouldn't take it. So I'll give it to somebody else. Still haven't given it away. Um, anyway, there are a variety of things, including on the right, that thing I, I made for, for her birthday. And she left it here. It's hanging on the wall right there. Everybody's seen it behind me. Uh, that's made out of like cherry wood. And the tiles are on the hardy backer. I saw the, actually, that was pre-stroke. I sawed it up on a sawmill. I had a wood miser sawmill that cherry tree came from um, our, our property up there. I sawed it with a sawmill and put it with the 25-year-old tiles we got in Italy. Anyway, the point of this is, you know, the land trust actually asked me about, who let's say I had my stroke in April and uh, by September, first of September, they gave they uh, had the awards at the fall festival. So somewhere a couple months, three or four months after my stroke, they asked me to frame a couple of pictures for them for the awards. I went, oh my gosh, I wonder if this will how this will work. Well, you got like double sided tape. You have to like pull out and not get it to stick to you or all over, wrap around your hand or anything. You got to like pull it all out and stick it down and peel stuff off. There's a lot of two-handed stuff. So I said, well, I'll do it. I'll, I'll try it. And I found that it took me about twice as long. I had done time and motion studies because I needed to know how long it took me to mat things and frame things because I was charging people for them and I wanted to get a certain hourly rate. So I had timed how long it took me to mat of uh, six eight by ten prints and that kind of thing so i had a pretty good idea it took me about double and um at this point i could do it in about 10 15 percent more time than, than i did pre-stroke just a, a few things are a little more difficult how did i get back to 10 or 15 percent by framing all this stuff remember it took me double in the beginning you know, so I got, I cut my time almost in half by doing it over and over again. You know, if I'd sat in the corner um, and I could have sat in the corner or could have told the land trust, well, I don't know if I can do that. I had a stroke. Instead, I said, sure, I'll give it a try. And, uh, you know, it was actually the hardest thing. And when I got the pictures framed, the land trust was upstairs at one of those old buildings above the store and it had like 20. And, Usually they're about somewhere between 10 and 14 steps in a house in a normal eight foot floor, nine foot floor. Well, they were up like 16 feet. There were like 24 steps. And here I had these two frames, one in each hand. And I went, okay, you can make two trips and you have a way to hold on to the railing, but you'd have to carry one up with your affected hand. And I said, ah, screw it. I'll just set them down if, if I have a problem or I don't think about having a problem. You won't have a problem. And I managed to, I, I didn't go up the middle because I went closer to the right in case I had to put the right one down and grab something or drop the right one and grab something because I wouldn't want to fall down. I'd rather bust a frame and remake it than fall down 24 step, steps. That's for darn sure. But, you know, once again, confidence. If you have confidence sometimes, confidence, not stupidity. If you have confidence in your ability to do something based on all the steps that you took to get there, um, a lot of times you can achieve something that surprises you. So, I marched right up 24 steps holding on to two pictures and I was pretty, pretty happy when I got to the top, you know, couldn't really explain it to anybody because they wouldn't understand. Oh, you're all thrilled because you made it up 24 <laughs> steps. Well, yeah, but I was. Uh, some more picture framing. This is one I made for my uh, nephew. Yeah, there you can see you got to cut the mats. There's a. Uh, two-sided uh, linen tape there for the hinge uh, the second mats on uh, he's in San Francisco so I actually built I built a little box out of one by twos and cheap uh, it's floor underlayment so I built that little box and screwed the whole thing together and shipped it to him main reason I built that box was I took the I took this print to UPS to um, ship it 
and they want to put it in a cardboard box that was like six inches bigger than the thing and put uh, peanuts all around. And they wanted $18 for the cardboard box and $6 for the peanuts. And now I've got this thing this big. It's oversized to uh, ship. So there was an oversized charge. It was $110. I said, I put the, the picture on the scale and uh, then I doubled it. It weighed like two pounds. I said, well, how much if it's this size right here and it weighs four pounds? And they calculated and said, uh, $26. I said, I'll be back to, in a couple of days. And I went home and built this thing and I shipped it to him for $26 instead of 110 But that probably doesn't surprise anybody here if they know anything about me. I'm, you know, kind of like a cheapskate for one, although it isn't that. It's just a it just shouldn't cost $110 to ship a picture. And, you know, a lot of these folks make it difficult for not just stroke survivors, for anybody. Okay, you walk in, you got a picture, you got to get it there. Most people aren't going to go home and build a box, but then I guess I'm not most people. So therapy's all around you, and I think that's it. Yeah, I couldn't see my slide. So anybody got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And the other thing would be, uh, I'd love to hear examples of um, like uh, oh, the types of things that you do for uh, therapy.